I don't have your papers for you <laughs> at this point. <laughs> it'll be Thursday, but I'm not going to say it'll be Thursday because something else will happen. And ended up spending two hours at the doctor's office with my wife yesterday. Okay, so <coughs> we left off on whatever it was last Thursday on page 345 with um, the knight having raped the maiden in the in the meadow and he's brought back essentially to King Arthur and Guinevere and Guinevere says you can live if okay and we're told 913 woe was this knight and sorrowfully he sicketh or sighs but he may not do as all him like it. That is, he can't go do what he wants. We're not told what he wants to do, but he obviously doesn't want to spend a year and a day trying to find out what women want, but he has to in order to live. And at the last, he chose, chooses for himself to go and come again right at the year's end. So he agrees, this is what I'll do. With such answer as, notice, God would him provide. Not women, God. Okay. I don't know if he's, you know, an Aristotelian and he thinks he's going to find out the one grand answer by asking all the women in the world that he can meet, and therefore that would be God, you know. Um, so, so what does Chaucer really mean there? With such answer as God, woe to him purvey. Woe doesn't only necessarily mean would. I mean, that's the modern English derivation. There it's desired, wished, because it's past tense, okay? That God desired to provide him. Now, our narrator, who again is who? It's not Chaucer. Our narrator is whom? The, wife of, the wife of Beth, okay? So she's putting this into his mentality, so to speak, okay? With such answer... As God desired to provide him. And so he does what? He takes his leave and goes forth. So he leaves thinking, God will answer my prayers. God will provide whatever I need. Pretty bold and gutsy move, isn't it? After all, why does he need to find this answer? Because he raped a woman. So he raped a woman, and now he's saying, Jesus will help me. <laughs> so, 919. <coughs> he seeketh every house and every place, whereas he hopes for to find grace, to learn what thing women love most. Notice, he hopes to find grace. He hopes to be given this information. That's what that hoping to find grace really means. To learn what thing women love most. But he couldn't arrive in any coast, whereas he might find in this matter two creatures. Notice creatures, not women, creatures. Two creatures according in fiera, that is, fellowship or agreement. That fiera comes from the old English, fiera, which is one of the words from. Um, Related to army or gathering of soldiers and such. So he's kind of describing women here, you know, pack mentality. He can't find any two, no matter where he goes. So what does that mean? There are one, two, three, four, five guys in here. And I don't know, 11 or 12, 13 women. That means one answer, a different answer, a different answer, a different, a different Kids. You think two of them could agree, but he can't find two anywhere that agree. He just keeps going. And he's like, one, 5,678, <laughs> and they all differ. Some like red cap, some like blue cap, some like green shirts, some like yellow shirts. And, you know, the yellow shirt's the most important thing in the world. 
some, notice, said women love best riches. And I don't know that the some here necessarily means our modern English some. It might have the older old English meaning of S-U-M, which means one. Okay. I think it's probably closer to this, but Chaucer could be hearkening back to an older meaning. Some said women love best riches. Okay, cool. Some said honor. Throw in the verb phrase, loved best. So, some riches, some honor, some jolliness, that is playtime, some rich array, costly clothing, some said lust in bed, good sex, and notice, not just good sex, and often time to be widowed and wed. Well, who said that? The wife of Bath. So we, we almost get this indication that the knight asked the wife of Bath. She goes, oh yeah, this is what I like. Hot sex and a dead husband. Not at the same time. <laughs> One first, then that, then another living husband with hot sex, and then he dies, you know, so that he, she would end up with what? The best riches and rich array, you know. Some said, ah, we get that nice possessive pronoun, possessive plural. Our hearts, what? Our most, I don't necessarily disagree with the gloss, but we get a word from the ESED, eased, eased, put at ease, okay? Our hearts be most eased or refreshed when we are flattered and pleased. Now, this is the wife of Bath telling us. This is Chaucer through the mouth of the wife of Bath telling us. Because I think most women today, saying this, obviously not as a woman, but most women would say, really? Really? Women are going to say, we, what we really want is to be flattered and pleased? How shallow. <laughs> so, he goes, full night, the sofa, I will not lie. He's not going near the south. What? He's getting close to the truth. So how is flattered and pleased close to the truth? Let's cut to the chase for a moment. What, what is the truth he discovered? What is it women want? According to this, not you individually, according to this. Otherwise, I'll end up with 14 different answers. In? Sovereignty in marriage, mastery in marriage. How many of you on an everyday basis use the word sovereignty or mastery? You don't. What do you use? What do both those words mean? Come on. One thing. Dominance. Close. Okay, if you're in the... <laughs> going there. Control's close, but it's not strong enough. Power. Power. It's not equality. <laughs> Does the wife want equality? No. Hell no. She wants, yeah, it's this kind of upper hand. That's what she wants. She wants power. That's what sovereignty, mastery, control, it's power. Okay? So, a man shall win us best with flattery and with attendance. What's attendance? Your gloss tells you attention. What does it really mean? Put it in modern language. Ladies, a guy, or maybe a girl, whichever, will win you best. What does it mean by attendance? Flattery is earlier. Taking care. What else? Yeah, that's what the gloss says. Give me another word. What's it mean for attention? How many of you use the word attention on a daily basis? Oh, go away. <laughs> <laughs> What's attention mean? 
Keep going. Is it just to be present? Like being in the same room as, does that count? No, engage. So it's actually participate. Engage. Part keep going. Help me out here, people. <laughs> really, help her out, man. Affection. Keep affection. Attentive. Attentive, related to attention, okay. Be a priority. Showering. Affection, attention, etc. That's what that's what that wooing's close, okay? But he means she becomes what to a man shall win us best with flattery and with attendance. Attendance there means I am what to him? Everywhere. Everything. That is, he doesn't have a smile on his face unless I'm around. Yeah. Okay. Oh. <laughs> Courtly love tradition, man. It's all there. Okay. And with notice. Diligence. There's another word we don't use, most people don't use on an everyday, ordinary basis. But we do use the word that Chaucer uses. Busyness. We pronounce it business because we've taken the Middle English meaning of it and we've extrapolated it to mean <coughs> what you do for work. What does business literally mean? Totally occupied. Being Totally busy, being about the busyness of what? Her. Her. That's why I said it's showering affection. Not showering, but, you know, giving all kinds of. So with these three things, flattery, attendance, and business, what? Are we elimid? Okay, you got a gloss down the bottom. We'll, come, we'll look at it in a minute. Both more and less. Elimed, gloss, limed. Lime was used to catch birds. So, with flattery, attendance, and business, we are what? If you use lime to catch birds, in birds, British um, euphemism, sexist euphemism for girl, a bird, and you lime them with flattery, attendance, and business. What are flattery, attendance, and business really? They bait. Or as Polonius calls it in Hamlet, springs to catch woodcocks. They're all what? Traps. Traps. Okay. Go back to the beginning how this begins. You go full nigh the truth. I will not lie. A man shall win. Notice, not might. This is shall. <laughs> Guys, you do these three, these three things, you got her. That's what some women say. And some say that we love best to be free. And so do right as us lest. That lest, that's the same word as lust we saw earlier. That is, as pleases us, has nothing to do with sex or sexual pleasure. It's to fulfill my desires, my wants, my needs, you know, that kind of thing. Okay? And that no man reprove us. It's not complain. Just a second, Alexander. Uh, oh, sorry, Alex. Okay. And reprove us, what? What are those last three words? Of our vice. Vice has the exact same meaning today as it did back then. Is a vice ever good? No, it's, it's a vice. It's always negative. And reprove us of our vice, but say that we be wise in nothing nice. Nice there meaning, the gloss there is perfect. Foolish. So, some, who's, who's the people saying this? Women. Some women say, we want to be free. I'm a free spirit. I don't want to be bowed down, bound down. Don't put the ball and chain around my finger. Don't put me in a cage. I want to do what I want. Free, open, you know, open marriage, whatever. And don't complain or reprove me of my vice. We're not told what that vice is, whether it's a singular vice or, you know, all eight of them, 
or seven of them, depending upon your counting. But say that we be both wise and not foolish. So let us do what we want and say, cool. That's what the wise and not foolish means. You have at it, honey. For truly, there is none of us all. The word none originally comes from no one. There is no one of us all. What? If any white will claw us on the gall, or if any person, creature, being, will scratch us on the neck, that we will not kick. If you bother us, if you complain, if you stop us from doing what we want, what are we going to do? We're going to kick you. Now, that might be just merely metaphorical. It might be we slap you. We get that upper hand. For he saith us truth. So don't speak truth to me. Do I look too fat in this? Don't speak truth to that. You know, am I? Don't speak. Why do you love? Don't answer. Or don't say, oh, it's because of your great body, it's because of your smile, it's because of your personality. Because when you answer that, what are you doing? You're picking one thing out of the whole package, so to speak. Okay? There is no right answer either sex to that question. Other than you. I just love you for being you. It's not you complete me nonsense. Okay? Don't, we won't go there. So, she says, essay. Essay means what? Well, your gloss tells you try. What other word do we have that's related to that? Put it. Assail. What do you do when you assail someone? You're going after them, hammer and tongs. Okay? So, try us. Prove us. This is all language from alchemy, by the way. The word prove comes from alchemy. The word test comes from alchemy. Okay? So, test us, try us, prove us, and he shall find that it so doth. You, you think I'm lying about what someone... Try it, buddy. And what's going to happen? You're going to get kicked. You're going to get scratched. For, we, for be we never so vicious within, nor we will be holden wise and clean of sin. So, we will be never so what? So vicious within, so wicked within, nay, okay, that we wish to be held wise and clean of sin. If you don't think that we're wise and what? Shakespeare does the same thing with, sheesh, how many? An awful lot of his sonnets. That we are wise and what? Clean within. So, as long as you think of us as wise and virtuous, everything's fine. Notice, if I think of you as wise and virtuous, am I really saying you are wise and virtuous? No. This is the old appearance versus reality theme. So that's what some say. And some say that great delight we for to be held stable and discreet. The ache, it's also. And discreet. And in one purpose, steadfastly to dwell. To dwell there means to live, to have as a habit. Okay? And not beray or betray something that men us tell. So, tell me your secrets. Go ahead. Promise. Lost my place. But that tale is not worth a rake stella. A rake stella. That is the handle of a rake. That's obviously an idiom. What obviously? Because even though we don't have the exact idiom in modern English, what does that mean? That's worth a pile of. <laughs> what is? That saying, that thing that some women say, that we are stable and 
discrete. What does what stable mean? Even temperament, even keel. I'm not going to go all crazy on you. Let's use that word that you know a lot of people today consider is totally sexist, hysterical, because of the H Y S T you know beginning. That tail is not worth a rake steel. Par D. What's par D mean? Comes from French. Par D. By God. Pardon. By God. That's what pardon means. Pardon me means by God me. Forgive me is what that means. So, par D. We women know nothing hella. By God, we women know nothing about how to keep a secret. Okay. Again, who's ultimately saying this? This is Chaucer. Okay. But he puts this in the mouth of the wife of Bath. Why? Well, step out from the tail for a moment and put yourself into, we don't have quite enough people, add about 10 people in here, into this group of pilgrims riding and walking to Canterbury, okay? And people are telling stories along the way, and suddenly the wife gets her turn. And what have we been told about the wife in the general prologue? She likes people to think highly of her. She likes people to respect her. If they don't, she's going to smack you. <laughs> she's got the gap teeth, so she likes sex. She's been married five times, okay? And she tells us this tale, and then she says, you know, this line. To everybody. I don't know. Women can't keep a secret. Well, who do you think among the pilgrims says, that's the truth. The, the men, <laughs> possibly. Only the men? Just the men? Any of the women? All the men? I don't think it's necessarily all the men. I think definitely some of the men, like the miller, if you've ever, if you, if you've never read all the Canterbury Tales, take a Chaucer course or read it on your own and read the Miller's Tale. It's one of the great dirty stories in English literature, okay? Because he's taking the Knight's Tale and turning it on its head, because the Knight's Tale is intended for this Sir Gowan of the Green Knight audience, an audience of lords and ladies. How many lords and ladies are there on this journey to um, St. Thomas of Becket's Shrine? Yeah, bingo, except for the Knight. So he's telling it to himself. And the miller interrupts him at the end. Drunk. He's drunk. Okay? And he takes the knight's tale and he goes, yeah, that's what you want to say life and love is really like, but this is what it's really like. It's about two guys having sex with one guy's wife and then third one trying to get in on the action, etc. And people getting, you know, burned with hot pokers and, you know, Chaucer goes everywhere on that. So, we women, we can't keep, keep a secret. Witness what? Midas. Ovid's metamorphosis. Although in Ovid's version, it's the king's barber, not his wife, who whispers the secret. And it could be because Chaucer had a bad version, or it could be Chaucer channeling what? His inter, inner anti-feminist. Okay? Not many scholars think Chaucer is quote unquote anti feminist. If anything, an awful people awful lot of people write of, write about him as being a um, a proto feminist, a, a kind of forward looking individual. Okay? So witness the tale of King Midas. You want to hear the tale? I think that's not just a rhetorical question. I think if we you know imaginatively set ourselves in the space of this tale, okay, some of the people go, yeah, sure, like probably the drunk miller, okay, and so she tells us the tale of Ovid, well, why, go back for a moment to something I said, you know, we weren't going to discuss much, the beginning of her prologue, okay, page 331, Experience, though no authority or no one authority were in this world, were right enough to me. Okay. 
she's she's setting up a um, a binary. That binary is experience versus authority. And in her prologue, she's going to talk about this. What's experience? Experience is what happens to me in my life, right? Or what happens to you in your life. What's authority? Who is, quote, unquote, an authority in your life? I, you don't have to answer this if you want, but some of you might. It might be a parent. It might be a boss. It might be a religious leader. It might be, if you really have no life, a political leader. It, a leader of some sort, right? Because what does that leader do? Who's part of the word? Lead, thank you. Okay. They become an authority. They tell you what to do, what not to do, right? Well, what's the ultimate authority in, for example, the Middle Ages? Ultimate, thank you. God. Way up here. Well, how do we know what God wants? The Pope. Okay, the Pope and the Bible. So, Papa, Pope, and the Bible. Most people can't read. Most people haven't heard of the Pope. <laughs> so, where do they get it from? They get it through the church, lower on down. And what do priests preach about? Biblical stories. Okay? And they often include stories because the people don't know the Bible themselves. So when she's talking about authority, she's talking largely about written sources. That's why she mentions Ovid. Ovid is an authority. Who else does she mention? If you read the prologue, she mentions a bunch of other people. She mentions, for example, St. Augustine. Not, for those of you in my history of the English language class, not the St. Augustine who brought Roman Christianity to England, but the St. Augustine who wrote, wrote The City of God. The St. Augustine who said, pleasure in sex is the original sin. And therefore, don't have pleasure in sex. Have sex if you're married, procreate, but don't enjoy it. Okay. So she's going to, going to juxtapose all this with this. What's her experience? Church said it's okay to get married. In fact, you ought to get married. Though St. Paul, who is an authority, right? St. Paul said, I think it would be better if all men were such as I am. Meaning, not married. Okay? But, if you can't, it's better to get married than burn. And some people interpret that to mean burn in hell. Okay? Because of out of wedlock sex, okay? Some also think it just means burning with, you know, lustful desires, so to speak. Doesn't matter which one, okay? Well, what did she also say about St. Paul? She essentially says he's crazy. If God made us this way and it's fun, God made us to have fun. That's what her experience. That's why she says, experience, though no authority were in this world, that is, if we didn't have any of this. Why? Because God isn't in this world, per se. She says, experience is good enough for me to, for what? To celebrate sex? No. To speak of woe that is in marriage. I don't need a preacher. I don't need a pope. I don't need a bishop. I don't need a biblical writer to tell me about problems in marriage. Why? Because her experience is going to tell us. She said, five husbands. So why does she keep getting married? If it's so bad, why get married again after number two? Or, excuse me, after number one. It's the gap tooth, folks. It's because she's horny. Okay? So, one dies, she gets married again. He dies, she gets married again. He dies, she gets married again. There's also a biblical authority as kind of a model for her. 
Any of you know the story of um, one day Jesus and his apostles, they were walking up through Samaria, and Jesus stops by a well to get a drink of water. Who helps them? Samaritan woman. Who are the Samaritans? If you're familiar with Harry Potter, they're like mudbloods. They are the vilest of the vile, the lowest of the low. If you're a modern-day Palestinian PLO-supporting Arab in Gaza, they're Jews. If you're a Jew, good Orthodox Jew, they're the modern-day Arab PLO-supporting, you know, rocket-launching terrorist in Gaza. I mean, you hated them. Jews and Samaritans had nothing to do with each other, which is why the parable of the Good Samaritan is so important. So, Jesus comes, there's this well. He starts talking to her. She's like, whoa, dude, don't you know who I am? I'm a Samaritan. He says, give me a drink of water. If you knew who I am, you wouldn't be asking. And he says, well, if you knew who I am, you wouldn't be telling me no. <laughs> drink of this water and you'll live eternally. And he, you know, what's he do? How does he prove what he says he's saying? Go, yeah. Go tell your, wait, wait, let me go get my husband. No, 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 you got five husbands. You had five husbands. And the one you're now with needs your husband. So, you've been married five times and now you're screwing around, literally, with somebody who isn't your husband. Doesn't mean, though it might, he's married to somebody else. <laughs> Could just mean he's single. And what, you know, blows your mind. Okay, that is an experience, okay, but that's also an example of an authority that she, the wife of Beth, is kind of held up to. She's kind of like the Samaritan woman at the well, but there's going to be a, a little difference, okay? So, she goes on in the prologue, talks about Christ and Jesus and all this kind of stuff. Go back to the tale for a moment. Oh, I don't know where I was going with some of that. Um... So the church said it was okay to get married once. Why? You got to to keep the race going. At least some people do. Eh, class of 30, okay. 15 of you are 20. 15 of you can stay, you know, good virgin celibate, love God the whole nine yards. The other five of you, you can be all sexual and sensually minded. Don't enjoy it, you know, but go off and reproduce. Once. The church allowed for a second marriage. In the Middle Ages. Usually only in cases of the spouse dies. Church frowned upon a third marriage. It was almost impossible to get a fourth marriage. She's been married five times. How much did she have to pay that fifth priest <laughs> to do the right? Okay. So and that goes back to Paul too, doesn't it? About how it's okay to remarry if your husband dies, but I wouldn't fool with it if it were up to me. Yeah. <laughs> nice pun there. I'm <laughs> fooling with it. Yeah, but he never says, oh yeah, three, four, five, you know, some of these, you know, famous Hollywood people, seven, eight, ten, twelve, whatever. Solomon. So, Ovid. And he tells us that she tells us the tale of Midas and the um, gold and such. Okay. Uh, let's skip a little bit and go to. End of that little passage about Ovid. Okay. 9, 80, 81, 82. So, I can't hide any counsel, she says, line 980. The remnant of the tale, if you will, if you want to hear it, what? Read Ovid. Go find a copy. Right. And there you can learn it. This night of which my tale is specially. Okay. Now, this is the character of the wife of Beth. Kind of, you know, breaking that fourth, imaginary fourth wall. The night that I'm actually talking about in this tale when that he saw, he might not come thereby. Come what thereby? The answer he's seeking. What is it women want most? Because he keeps getting all different answers. 
Then is to say what women love most. Within his breast full sorrowful was the ghost, but home he goes. Why is his ghost spirit within his breast full sorrowful? That he's going back and I'm screwed. What's he going to tell Guinevere? It's like he has a whole bunch of straws, right? Each one is slightly different length. Here, <laughs> you pick. He doesn't know which one of these is the right answer. All he has are multiple conflicting answers. He might not sojourn. Sojourn. Delay. Why? Year and a day is coming up. The day was come that homeward must he turn, and in his way it happened him to ride. Notice that construction. It happened him. Now, Chaucer, because he's writing in Middle English, doesn't have to use as many prepositions as we do. Right? We've got to use prepositions to indicate certain things. What would we usually put before that him? It happened to him to ride. Okay? What does that mean? What is about to happen came at him, so to speak. He didn't cause this. Okay? It happened to him to ride in all this care under a forest side where he saw upon a dance go ladies four and twenty and yet more. Okay? So, he's riding and suddenly upon him comes to his sight he sees in a forest four and twenty maidens and more. I never thought about that before. Oh, shop, Siri. Four and twenty. That's how many tales are told in Canterbury Tales, beginning to end. I wonder if Chaucer is, hmm, let's see if Shirley said anything about that. I don't think he said anything. If anybody's done anything about that. Anyways, so he does what? Well, there's 24 more what? Plus possible answers. So he rides towards them, in hope that some wisdom should he learn. But certainly, before he fully came there, uh, vanished was this dance he knew not where. How did they vanish? Do people normally just whoo, disappear in thin air? Unless you're in fantasy land or, you know, Marvel movie or something, they don't just disappear into thin air. Unless, how did her tale, not the prologue, the tale begin? In olden days, what? There were fairies everywhere. Well, fairies can do that. Fairies can disappear right in front of your eyes. So, no creature saw he that bar leaf, bore life. Doesn't mean he sees 24 plus dead bodies. It's what had been a bunch of people. Now we're gone, and now he doesn't see anybody. Save, save, except on the green he saw sitting a wife. Okay. With, notice your gloss. It doesn't mean married woman, historically, etymologically. It just means a woman comes from Old English with man, woman, man. Man here meaning what? Collectively in this room, human. Woman, human. Guess what the other one was? In some instances you see this. Where, man? Male, human. Okay. You don't see that much. It's usually just where. Um, so, he sees a woman sitting on the meadow. And then we get a description of her. By 999. A fowler white there may no man devise. Now, I don't know about you. I've got a pretty good imagination. Can think pretty foul. 
I mean, kind of like what C.S. Lewis says in the preface to, to Screw Tape. He said, you know, Screw Tape was the easiest thing he ever wrote. Why? All he had to do was let himself go. He had to take those quote unquote inhibitions you have and put them aside for a moment and just let the rot that's within have free reign. Okay? Every now and then, just for fun, show you how twisted I am, you know, kind of do that. And I've thought of, you know, tortures and such that would make Hitler and the Gestapo blush to even think of. I mean, it just shows, you know, the inner golem kind of a thing. Okay? So he says, you couldn't devise, you couldn't imagine. What does he mean by foul? Uglier. Not about you, but I can think of pretty ugly. I've seen pretty ugly before, okay? If, according to St. Anselm, I think it's St. Anselm, God is that with, that beyond which one cannot conceive, she is ugliness beyond which one cannot conceive. She's the god of ugliness. Wow, she's the goddess. I mean, let's be gender specific here. She's the goddess of ugliness. What does that mean? If you were to see this person walking down the street, be honest. Be totally honest. What would you more than likely do? Stare or go to the other side of the street? Cross. Why? How many people have, you know, aversions about a black path, black cat crossing your path? You don't want the ugliest thing that's ever lived to come around you because it might be catching, you know? So, again, the night this old wife again rise, that is, towards the night. Against means opposite to the night. She starts to get up. Why? Oh, lick, you know, <laughs> bait, you know, or lunch. And says, this is how I know she's getting ready, and says, Sir Knight, hereforth nailith no way. Road ends here, buddy. That's what that means. Here forth lies no way. From here on, no road. Now, what might be one thing Chaucer means by that? This is the end of your road. This, I, quote the U2 song, I am what you've always been looking for. I am the answer to all your problems. And he could, you know, barely even look at her because she's so ungodly ugly. Poor God. Yeah. Tell me what you seek by your faith. What do you mean by your faith? By everything you hold true, by everything you believe in, tell me what it is you want. By your God, <laughs> tell me the truth. What is it you seek? Per adventure, it may the better be. That is, you might find what you're seeking <laughs> here. These old folk, con, that is no, Mucho, much, or many things, says she. Have we, have we gotten any indication of the age of the people he's asked questions of? Yes. Not really. Just women generically. My leva mordor, quod this knicht, certain. My dear mother. Why does he call her that? Keep going. Something we don't have anymore, but something that was very prominent in the Middle Ages. Respect for elders. Well, how elder might she be? She might be the elder. Because <laughs> she's really ugly. <laughs> and that ugliness can be age. Right? I am but dead, but if that I can say what thing it is that women most desire. And notice, he tells her what it is he's seeking. 
even though we're told she's the ugliest thing in the world. So, I'm a dead man, unless I can answer what it is women want. Could you, me, Wissa, could you, Wissa, make that known to me? I would well quite your hire. I will repay you very well. I will repay you for that hire, for that work. Okay? She goes, sure, cool. Plate me thy trough. Middle English, plate me the truth there. Here in mean hand, quod she. Let's shake on it. Okay? Plate me thy trough right here, without anything else that comes later, doesn't necessarily me, uh, mean engage yourself to me to be wed. It means what? Louder? Shake on it. Shake on it. Promise me. That is, what did he just say? I'll make it worth your while. Promise me. Let's shake on it. Let's, let's make this a bond, a promise. Okay? Swear it to me. The next thing that I require thee, next thing that I ask of you, what? You shall do it if it lie in your might. And I will tell you before it even gets to be night. Sound like anything else we've already read? Thanks her gown in the green night. Two times, actually, four times. What does Sir Gowan agree with the Green Knight at the beginning? Yeah, sure, I'll take a swing. Oh, you won't tell me where you live until after? Okay, <laughs> that's what you want. There's one time. He agrees to something without what? Knowing exactly what he's agreeing to. Knowing exactly what he's agreeing to. And then, on three successive nights. Yeah, I'll give you whatever I find. Okay, <laughs> so she says, swear to me, what? Swear to me that what I ask of you next, you will do if it's in your ability, if it's in your power. And he says, okay. Does he have any idea what she might ask him? No. What's he thinking? Okay, possibly. What else? I think it has something to do with her looks. She's so old, ugly, and foul. Surely she's not interested in sex. I mean, she's way beyond her at this point. He says, have ye my truth, I promise. On what? His faith. I swear by God, I'll do it. Then should she... I dare me well avant, I dare me well boast, <clears throat> thy life is safe, that is, I saved your life. No, it hasn't happened yet, but don't worry, you'll live. For I will stand thereby. I will stand thereby means what? How many of you have read the Harry Potter stories? Come on, your English makers. You know okay. In one of the Harry Potter stories, Harry's going to have a duel with Draco Malfoy, and Ron agrees to be his second. Anybody knows that third, what that refers to? If Harry goes down or Harry chickens out, Ron's got to jump in. Ron's got to be the duelist. Okay? So when she says, I will stand thereby, when your life's on the line, I will be there. She's not just saying, come on, Sir Gallon, you can do it. She's not going to be there cheering him on. She's saying, if I'm wrong, I'll be the one to die. She's saying, I will be your guarantee. Okay? Kind of like what, if you read it, what the fairy lady does in Lonval. You know, she shows up Arthur's house. She goes, Come on, take a look. Okay, now take a look at Guinevere. No show, right? I mean, no, no contest. I win, she loses. Okay? 
This life is safe, for I will stand thereby. My life is safe. Upon my life the queen will say as I. Let's see which is the proudest of them all, that weareth on a coverchief or a call, that is hairnet, that dare say nay of what I shall teach. Kind of interesting that she talks about the proudest who, you know, has a coverchief and stuff, because that's one of the descriptions we get of the wife of Bath in the general prologue. She has like 10 pounds of cloth on her hair. Why? It was a sign of holiness to have your head covered. So, if you can be holy with one ounce of cloth, put 10 pounds on, what does that mean? Oh, I'm super holy. I mean, if holiness can be bought, Make it a hell of a lot easier. So, she says, um, Let's go forth without longer speech. Then round she a pistol in his ear. She whispered a lesson in his ear and bade him to be glad and have no fear. What is it she whispered in his ear? Here's what we're going to do. Notice, the wife doesn't tell us yet. Why? building that suspense. She wants us to find out later. So, they come to the court. <sighs> Taking too long. And this knight said, he kept his, his day as he had promised. Ready was his answer, as he said. And full many a noble wife, and many a maid, and many a widow, and those that are wise, and the queen herself, sitting as justice, they assembled. It's kind of like all the women of the kingdom. They're gonna, coming in, they're going to go, yeah, what's the answer? I don't know what the answer is. Because he's probably asked all of them, and he's gotten conflicting answers. So they're going to sit in justice. And afterward, this knight was commanded to appear. Every white commanded with silence. That is, Gallant, shut up back there. King orders silence. And that the knight should tell an audience what thing that worldly women love best. Because I think the knights are also wondering, what, what can we do? <laughs> And so he stood, did not stand still as of the beast, but to his question immediately answered with manly voice. That is, he announces loudly, My liege lady, liege, I am your servant. That's what that means. I am sworn to honor, obey, protect you, etc. Okay? Women desire to have sovereignty as well over their husband as their love. What? They want sovereignty over their husband. What's the as their love mean? As their, the women's love? That is, is that not the husband? Well, according to love tradition, it might not be. It also, I mean, that's one possibility. It could also mean they want sovereignty over their husband as well as their husband's love. In other words, we're not going to have any double standard in this marriage. It's not going to be, hey, you know, what's good for the goose is not good for the gander. Okay? If I can't go sleeping around, excuse me. Yeah. If I can't go sleeping around, you can't go sleeping around and vice versa. Cool. This is your most, your greatest desire, though you me kill. What's the though you me kill? And if I'm wrong, kill me. Do as you please. That's the list. I am at your will. Will, there, goes back to this. I am at your desire. Should you really say that to Guinevere if you're a man? No, you shouldn't. <laughs> In all the court, not was there wife nor maid. Notice the construction Chaucer just used. In all the court, not was there wife nor maid. Double negative. What does double negative mean according to modern rules of grammar? Cancels out, right? It's positive. No. Double negative is for what purpose? Emphasis, man. Chaucer even uses triple negatives. He's going to make it really, really, really clear. Notice the triple positive there, okay? There was 
neither wife nor maid nor widow, that contrary that he said, but said, gotta live. Got us. He's right. And I think the night you're sitting around are going, really? That, wait, you want what? <laughs> you want mastery? Mastery, control, power. And with that word, up started the old wife. It's kind of interesting. She can up start. That kind of implies she's sitting and she jumps up into a standing position. Okay. I'm 57. When I do, you know, prostrations at church or I'm working out at the gym and I get down on the ground, it takes me a few seconds to get off the ground. It's usually like Rice crispy, you know. <laughs> Body parts crackling, and she's got to be older than me, hopefully. <laughs> I tell myself she is. She upstart, and with that, the night <laughs> saw sitting in the green. So she jumps up and she goes, Ooh, he's kind of hot. <laughs> Mercy, my sovereign lady queen. She calls Guinevere her sovereign, her queen. And yet it's pretty clear this old lady's what? Get to the end of the story. Or maybe it's not pretty clear. Do we know for sure that she's human? Morgan Le Fay? Yeah. Um... <laughs> No, I don't think there's anything in, in this text that implies she's Morgan Le Fay. I think it's possible because of who he saw dancing in the green before he saw her. And because of what happens at the very end, she might be a fay. That is a fairy. And, you know, because she can, you know, <laughs> and suddenly turn from old and ugly to swimsuit model. Old and ugly swimsuit model, you know. You don't want to get the two mixed up because that'd be scary. Okay, so what does she do? Okay, what promise did she extract from the night, or extort from the night? Might be one way of looking at it. Whatever I ask, you have to do it if it's in your power, right? Okay, because she could ask him, "Bring me the moon," and he'd go, ha, "Can't do it." What she asks, that is in his power. Before your court depart, your court depart or cart deport, whichever, do me right. <laughs> she says, I I gave him this answer. On the condition, what? That he would do the next thing I asked of him. And he agreed, he promised. He swore. You know. He would do it if it lay in his might. So Notice, in front of everybody here, the old Camelot assembled. She says, I pray thee, Sir Knight, that thou take me unto thy wife. For well thou knowest that I have kept thy life, and if I say false, say nay upon thy faith. That is, if, I say, if I'm lying, say so. Now, I kind of think, because I like to read into things just slightly, or I like to dramatize them, maybe is the way of putting it. I think when she says, you marry me, some of those other knights are going, <laughs> sucks to be you. <laughs> Lanval's sitting there, you know, going, yeah, I'm going to go back to my fairy lady later. You know. Of course, he's off in Avalon. So, the knight answers, alas, and wail away. Your gloss tells you, woe is me. Just what everyone wants to hear. Yeah. Alas, and wail away. Hell no. <laughs> Ditto. I know right well that such was my behest. Yep, I promise that. For God's love, woman, choose something else. What do you mean? You know, I'll kill a dragon for you. I'll kill a monster for you. I'll do anything but that. Take all my goods. Let my body go. <laughs> She's gone. Uh-uh, buddy. <laughs> that is the goods. <laughs> Nay, I shrew us both too. I curse us both. For though that I be foul, 
little self-awareness. Foul, old, and poor. I, Nolde, would not, not desire for all the metal nor the ore that is all the wealth of the world that under earth is buried or lies above, but if thy wife I were and also thy love. Notice, she doesn't just want to marry him. What else? She wants his love. Not only have to, do you have to marry me, you have to love me. <coughs> okay, we could do the first part, maybe. The loving part. I mean, arranged marriages, all that kind of stuff. Um, I'm a kind of an off-topic question. On 1062... Off-topic? This class? <laughs> 1062, she says, nay, then, if, if I'm reading that right. Nay, then. Okay, and I understand that the translation is then, but, I mean, he's a knight... I just can't help but the thane. Is there any type type of like? No, there's no connection? no relation between those two. That's and the concept. Of yeah, like, that is just simply okay. adverbial then. Okay. So, my love. He's not calling her my love. Okay, I understand. It's. Are you crazy? Okay, you can have my body. You can't have my love. You know that's someone else. I guess. Nay, my damnation. If I were to love you, I'd go to hell. Wow. He got away with the word. Yeah, he's a, oh, he's a sharp one, he is. <laughs> Probably why he raped the maiden in the first place, you know. Not quite dealing with a full deck. Alas, that any of my nation, he doesn't mean the United States of America, Great Britain, or Thurian Camelot, should ever so foul disparaged be. Your gloss tells you family. What does it? What does it really I mean? Family, yes, definitely involved there. What does it really mean? Anyone of my blood, anyone of my DNA genetics, my father, my grandfather, my great grandfather, my great great grandfather. He says what? They would should ever so foul disparaged be. What's he mean by that? <coughs> Honey, I am so far above you in my birth. So what's the knight have a little problem with? Pride? What's another word for pride? It's a little bit worse than pride. Arrogance. Arrogance. Hubris. Okay. How bad is his arrogance? He thinks what is all important. This hasn't changed much in the last 600 years. We like to think we are a quote-unquote classless society, or we don't place a lot, of a lot of importance on heredity and stuff. Bullshit. We do. Okay. I mean... Certain names in our political culture still what? They have resonance. Kennedy. Even though, if you look historically at the Kennedy, talk about slime. Bush, slime, okay? Clinton, won't even touch that one. Okay. We could go back. Adams, look at the two Adams, fam Adams family. Look at the Adams father, son. Had some issues. There's this idea that your blood, who is your parent, where you are, dis who you are descended from, is all important. That's what the knight thinks. Guess what? That's the whole part, at least, of the whole reason the wife tells this story. She is getting to the heart of that matter. Should ever so foul disparage be, but all for naught. That is, for nothing. The end is this, that he constrained was. Notice, that's the wife saying that. He constrained was means what? Rock, hard place. Does he have a choice in the matter? In one sense, no. In another sense, yes. What's the choice? <laughs> so he could choose to die or not. 
any similarity to a previous tail. Ooh, that is a very nice green sash. The thoroughly modern knight is wearing this everywhere he goes. So, he needs must her wed and take his old wife and go to bed. Notice the wife's important, you know, where she lays the emphasis. Lays unintended pun. <laughs> it's in bed. He not only has to marry her, what? He's got to sleep with her. He's got to sleep with her. Why? Because, as you will see, if we ever get to John Donne, John Donne, it says in one of his poems, though we more than married are. How can you be more than married? Either you are or you aren't, right? No. You can be married and not have sex. Because what has to happen for, at least in the eyes of the church, especially the Catholic Church, for that marriage to be valid? It has to be consummated. So if you have, if you get married and you never consummate the wedding, 40 years later, you can get an annulment. Not a divorce. Annulment. If you can prove it's never been consummated. Okay? More than married. Now would some men say, per adventure, your gloss tells you, perhaps, by chance, that for my negligence I do no cure to tell you the joy in all the array that at the feast was that same day. To which things shortly answer I shall. Notice, some might say, now, why does she include that? Because I think that is Chaucer, through the mouth of the wife of Bath, taking a shot at Chaucer. Go back to the general prologue. Chaucer says, he begins the general prologue, and he says, it happened on a day while I was at the tavern, waiting, getting ready to go on my journey to um, Canterbury, that nine and twenty people in a company came into the tavern. And he goes on and says, and since I had the time, I think I should tell you about these nine and twenty, their array, their estate, their condition. That's what she's talking about. Oh, so some of you want to hear about the knights and the ladies? That is, you want to know how the ladies are dressed, if the knight are, knights are handsome, etc., etc.? I'll, I'll get to that in a moment. I say there was never no joy nor feast at all. There was not nothing but heaviness and sorrow. Why? Because even though earlier I said the knights are going, they and all the ladies of Camelot are thinking what? Oh, poor sir, question mark, because he's never named that he has to marry her. Because notice, if you're a lady at Camelot, what does that automatically, automatically say about you? If you're a quote-unquote Hollywood actress on the red carpet, what does that say about you? You're a babe. <laughs> Even if, should I... Should I give an example? I shouldn't go there, should I? Just well, step in it with both feet. Even if you're Kathy Bates. Fantastic actress. I know. Sorry, see, I did it. Emma just, you know, Sherman. <laughs> <laughs> Is Kathy Bates a babe? No, she's not. <laughs> Would I say that to Kathy Bates' face? Hell no. Okay? If you've ever seen any of her films or ever seen her in the office, She's one of the greatest actresses we have. But she's not drop-dead gorgeous. But some of those who are drop-dead gorgeous can't act worth a lick. Okay? They can't hold a candle next to Kathy Bates. These people are all about what? They're all about image. They're all about perception. They're all about looks. If they had Max Factor, Maybelline, and plastic surgeons... They'd be all over it, okay? So, she says, For privily, privately, he wedded her on a morning, and all day after, hid him as an owl, right? Because what do owls do during the day? Sleep. They're gone. You don't see them. He gets married in the morning, and he's gone. So, woe was him. His wife looked so foul. Great was the woe that a knight had in his... Uh, thought when he was with his wife a bed he brought 
It was a custom for wedding guests to escort the bride and groom to their bedroom. <coughs> and we have accounts of them literally being carried. Put in the room, lock the door. You ain't coming out. <laughs> Until I won't even give you some of the other, you know, customs that we know about that happen to prove the wedding was consummated. To prove the marriage was consummated. Right? So he wallows and he turns to and fro. His old wife lay smiling ever well, evermore. <laughs> he said, Oh husband, you Benedicite that has blessed you. Fareth, is this who all the knights at the round table are with their wives on their wedding nights? There, there's something weird going on there. Is this the law of King Arthur's house? Notice what's being questioned. It's not just the knight's behavior, it's what? It's the whole reputation of Camelot. What had happened? What happened at the end of Sir Gowan? What are we told was the purpose for the knight to go there? To question the whole reputation of Camelot. Okay, so now we have two tales that are doing that. Longball kind of does it too. Guess what? There's a whole bunch of other ones. You start to see a pattern? So if Arthur is this great model of the night, why is everybody questioning his reputation? Hmm. Is every night of his so dangerous and offish? I'm your love and your wife. I... Oh, yeah, I saved your life. You owe me, buddy. And certainly, yet never did I you never unright. I've never wronged you in any way whatsoever. Why are you acting like this? Ah, she's doing what? She's stripping away appearances. She's getting, phrase I used earlier, at the heart of the matter. That is, the heart of his matter and at the heart of the matter of her tale. Right? You act like a man who lost his wit. What is my guilt? Okay. What can you have guilt for? Louder? Can you? If Alexander steals Ben's car, can I have guilt for that? Hell no. It's not my car, first of all. Ben, you know, if he gets caught, I don't care. No, I can't. I can only have guilt for what I've done. She says, what have I done? What's my guilt? What have I done against you? Come on, tell me. If, if I can amend it, if I can fix it, if I can repair it, I will. He's like, right. Alas, nay, nay. You know, let's pull the cover up over your face. <laughs> or pull it down. No, you can't fix that. It will not be amended, never more. Thou art so loathly. Oh, he's so harsh and cruel. And so old. <laughs> okay. If you're born ugly, middle ages, let's leave today modern plastic surgery, all that out of the way. You're born ugly in the middle ages. What can you do about it? Nothing. You get to be 57 or 87 or 187. Who knows how old she is? 2 billion seven. Can you do anything about that? No, you cannot. If you're born with blue eyes, you can't change that. If you're born without a voice to sing, you can't change that. <laughs> you can try, but you're what? Swimming up a stream. Okay? You can't change it. So, he says, you're so god-awful ugly, you're older in dirt, what else? <laughs> and you come of so low a kind, a nature, a birth. Can you change your parents? Notwithstanding what our legal culture says about you know, children divorcing their parents, no, you can't. Good question. Good question. Are we told anything about her parentage? No. Why does he make that assumption? Because she's uglier in sin. 
<laughs> and we know it's sin's parent is, right? You know, she's the daughter of the devil kind of a thing. But also, she's not born of any of the lines of the, like, men of yeah, Camelot. Then he could, uh, apparently, yeah. you know, because nobody goes, Mama! You know, <laughs> as she comes in. Okay? So. <laughs> that little wonder is, though I wallow in wine, so would God my heart break. Take me now, God, <laughs> before I have to sleep with this thing. And she goes, really? And this is, this is your problem? Uh, yeah. <laughs> yes, certainly. No wonder is. She goes, well, shoot, I could fix this. I could amend all this if it pleased me. In three days' time. Biblical echo. <laughs> okay. Destroy this temple. I'll rebuild it in three days. Destroy this ugliness. And I'll make it pretty. So will you might bear you unto me. Give me what I want and what? I will amend this. Give me what I want. And what is she saying? And I will give you what you want. What's she really asking for? Power. Power. Give me the power to do what? To do what you want. But who still has the power? She does. Okay? But let's pause there for a moment, though. You speak of, he hasn't used the word Gentil Essa. Okay? Hugely important word in literature, late literature of the Middle Ages. Chaucer, Sir Gowan of the Green Knight, because it's used in Sir Gowan of the Green Knight. You speak of Gentil Essa as is descended out of old riches. What's at the root of that word? Gentle. Not Gentile. Gentle. G-E-N, modern English. G-E-N-T-L-E. -E. Okay. What modern word do we get from that other than gentle? Gentlemen. Gentlemen. That idea, gentlemen, goes back 600 years at least. Okay. What does it refer to? And it's corollary. Levity. Lady. Goes back 600 years. It has everything to do not with birth, but behavior. A quote-unquote true gentleman behaves X, Y, Z way. A quote-unquote true lady behaves X, Y, Z way. Okay? So, she's going to talk about gentilessa. You speak of gentilessa, she says, as is descended out of old riches. That is, you speak of this that comes out of what? When she says old riches, she doesn't mean money. She means this. DNA. All kind of wealthy families and such. Okay? That therefore, should ye be gentlemen, such arrogance is not worth the hen. That is, if you come from an old family... Therefore, you must be what? J.K. Rowling deals with this in the Harry Potter novels. You must be a gentleman. In the Harry Potter novels, she doesn't use this language. She uses the language of what comes before? Pure blood. If you are a pure blood, it doesn't matter how you behave. All that matters is that your blood is pure. And that's what's important. And yet, as Dumbledore repeatedly says, pure blood people can be what? Jackasses. <laughs> totally, completely. They can also be evil. There's a difference between being a jackass and an evil. A jackass is just a moron. An evil is an evil person, right? You think your family name is everything, she says. That's arrogance. Look who that is most virtuous always. Privy and apart 
and most intendeth I to do the gentle deeds that he can. So what does she mean by that? Look, who is always the most virtuous. Privy and apart means what? In their private dealings, by themselves. The person who is virtuous, when nobody is out there to see. What did Christ say about giving alms? Do it privately. Do it so that the left hand doesn't know what the right hand is doing. Or fasting. Don't do it so that your face is all contorted and everything. Why? Because then you're just trying to get, you know, approval of people. He says, do it so that nobody even knows you're fasting. What's her point? Those who are really virtuous, they don't what? Hey, look at me. I'm being virtuous today. Aren't I great? That's not true gentilessa, she says. To do the gentle deeds that he can, that is, that he is able to. Take him. Who's that for the greatest gentleman? Now, I have no proof of this. But I think she's pointing, possibly, to a couple people who are on this pilgrimage. The last two people, I think it's the last two. It's the last one, definitely. I think the other one might not be for the second one. People that Chaucer refers to in the general prologue. There are two individuals that he holds up for praise that he doesn't say anything negative about. They are, yeah, we won't finish. We'll get close. We won't get close. <laughs> they are the plowman and the parson. Why does he hold those two up, or how does he hold those two up? How are they the most perfect of all the people? What's he say about the plowman? First of all, what is a plowman? Modern English language. Louder? Farm hand. Where I grew up, my dad had a lawn business, which was my dad, my brother, and I, <laughs> and a couple of guys every now and then. Ditch digger. That is, if we were putting in, you know, um, sprinkler lines, we dug the ditches. Okay? Which in the clay, the soil we had in California, was sometimes like digging through concrete with pickaxes, okay? Not easy work. But this guy does his work for what? Free. If somebody needs a ditch dug, call him. If somebody needs a stable cleaned, call him. Okay? What about his brother? Literal brother. The priest. The parson. He is poor but rich in spirit. He's poor but rich in spirit. He has those great lines. <laughs> he has those great lines in the general prologue. Uh, lines 500 and following. If gold rust, what shall iron do? For if a priest be foul on whom we trust, no wonder is a lewd man, that is an unlearned man, to rust. And shame it is if a priest take care or heed, a shitten shepherd and a clean sheep. A shepherd, a priest covered in shit, <laughs> helping his sheep who are clean. Okay. We'll stop there and come back and we'll finish at some point. <laughs> At which point, maybe I'll also have your papers for you. <laughs> you you won't get the exam until you get your papers back. Let's put it that way. <laughs> <laughs>